Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Alex on Tech. Now, it's time to welcome Chris Griffith, a legendary award-winning journalist, communications professional, technology reporter, writer, commentator, speaker, tech expert, and media personality. Chris is nearly two years into his freelancing career after spending 15 years as the senior writer for technology at our most important newspaper, The Australian, and not only still has articles published there, but is also published regularly at channelnews.com.au and who very generously joined me on my new TNT Radio Live Talking Tech TV show and uh, is joining me again right now on this Alex on Tech YouTube channel. So thank you very much, Chris, and welcome. Welcome to the program. Great to be here again, Alex. Uh, good uh, to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. I really appreciate it. Now, Chris, this Saturday, you'll be arriving in Barcelona, Spain, to attend the 2024 Mobile World Congress, which is billed as the world's largest and most influential connectivity event. Now, you've been going for years, and while I'll definitely be joining you on the ground next year as a fellow media attendee, it will be so cool to speak with you live uh, during the conference over Zoom when all the action is happening next week. So we'll go into more MWC details in a moment. But before we do, and ignoring what we expect to see this year, what was the most impressive thing you've seen thus far in all the years that you've attended? Well, Alex, there's been a few things. I, a few years ago, I went uh, with an Optus sponsorship, and this was maybe 2018, mm -hmm. and they produced smart watches with $100 on them that we could use and use watches to buy our lunch in Spain, which I thought was pretty cool at the time, but it's everywhere now since. We got into big trouble, though, because the vendors at the conference spoke Spanish and we didn't, and they thought we were joking when we tried to uh, swipe hey. our watches, and uh, they were very angry and we couldn't speak Spanish. So we nearly got clobbered, but I survived <laughs> that. Um, probably the other thing is last year, and this uh, is a segue into what we're talking about today, um, I often visit the component makers at these conferences. You might think, well, what, why would you do that? It's a bit like, you know, visiting the people who, who make the nuts and bolts in a Meccano set. Um, mm. But they have the – they can tell you what phones are going to be like in two or three years' time because they're making the chips to mm. – and they're designing the chips for that. And – uh, MediaTek last year, they showed me not only the current chips which allow you to text from an ordinary phone to a satellite, mm. uh, but they had a, a prototype and they did a demonstration of making a video call from a normal phone uh, to a satellite and the quality was really good. I'm not saying it's HD, but it was really good. And I can see, and basically they've said, within two or three years' time, we'll be able to go 500 kilometres west of Uluru, where there's absolutely no uh, ground network, and make really nice video uh, calls with our normal phones to our folks back in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, wherever they happen to be. And uh, that was working 12 months ago. Yeah. That was at last year's conference. So they would rate as two kind of really noteworthy things that I've seen that have longer-term significance. Absolutely. Now, look, before we get back to the telecommunications tech nirvana that is the Mobile World Congress show floor, there's going to be a lot of news and activity around satellites in 2024, which you just alluded to, and specifically of the LEO or the Low Earth Orbit variety. So before we get to the new Wizbang developments, why are low Earth orbiting satellites so important? And how are we already using them today before any of these new developments have even arrived to improve our lives and the planet? Well, I, I, the answer is pretty simple in a way. Uh, the current satellites that we use are in what's known as geostationary orbit. They're about 35,000 kilometres above the Earth. So the signals take a long time to get up and come back. Um, and so that's, that's why we haven't been able to achieve really great speeds with, say, Sky Master, for example, mm -hmm. why people who... Um, have NBN satellite feeds kind of a, a cursing in their cornflakes in the morning when they can't get decent speeds and so on. Um, LEO satellites travel much, much closer to the ground. Uh, 
In the case of, uh, I'm just trying to think, Starlink, they're only about 500 kilometres above the Earth. Uh, one web is about double that. And you can imagine uh, that it gives you much better, much, much more succinct transmission. Mm. And, uh, and also when it comes to imaging, I mean, you know, taking a pit 35,000 kilometres away from a satellite, if it does take pictures, it's mainly using data on the geostationary one. You're not going to get nearly the resolution and the detail that, that the brilliant stuff that these can take. Mm. They have their downsides too, uh, which we can go into, but because they're closer, what, what we've got the chance in Australia of doing is looking at wherever we've got uh, kind of mediocre satellite coverage of replacing it with leo satellite coverage and making a big big difference to the people in regional and remote australia in in what they can do and that is before we even look at what's happening in, on the business side of things which we'll probably go into as well yeah well let's go on to that right now who is getting to the leo satellite business and what will these new developments allow the telecommunications companies to newly be able to do and offer that they just couldn't do before well, I, I don't think it's any secret that Elon Musk is the biggest player with about 5,000 uh, Starlink LEO satellites already up there. And uh, they have a plan, according to their website, of 40,000. Now, 40,000 of um, I called um, these clever little buggers uh, up in space, yeah. um, if you're in a intrepid uh, Virgin Galactic uh, uh, kind of uh, tourism flight, you'd yeah. be, you know, uh, thinking about the fact that you're dodging them. I'm sure the technology is there, but, yeah. you know, it's a lot of satellites to, to get around. Uh, but it, that's enormous. Uh, One Web, which is in the UK, is the other player at the moment. Their satellites are about twice the distance of Starlink's. Um, there's slightly lower speed as well, the slightly higher latency. Uh, but they're the other player, but they're looking at a, a more modest about 500, I think, at, at the moment. Um, and and we've got Amazon in the wings. Amazon did their tests uh, last year uh, of some prototypes. And I'd be expecting that this year, I may, may be wrong, but, but it just seems the timing is right for them to start really announcing that um, because they work of course, with AWS, and AWS already is, you know, talked about its ground stations and what they can offer business. Because um, one of the things that both these satellites and ground stations can do, and, and there's work by Australian startups in uh, this area, like Alula, for example, is edge computing on the satellite itself. So, for example, you might have uh, 500 images that are being collected there and uh, of of bushfires from a leo satellite um some of them show nothing it could go through and actually get rid of the images that don't show anything about a bushfire and then send the rest so you actually cut down on transmission because work can be done on those satellites you can have ai operating there machine learning and the same for the ground stations and i think you'll see a big push by amazon to say not only can we um, transmit your data and, and, and that by satellite, but we can actually go through and process it and summarise it so that at the end of the day, you're getting more as the summary you need rather than a long, long and slower list of, of your real data. That's the sort of things that are coming with these. At the moment, with Starlink, uh, which is the, the player here in Australia um, until recently, the only one uh, of note, uh, we've got internet, which has been pretty good speed. You know, people have been impressed with what Starlink offers for not all that much money. It's mm. you know, you pay in the hundreds or for your months, but but people have been really impressed with that. And uh, that's one model where you're going straight up and down uh, to the satellite. But the others are, are choosing to have a ground station with a big dish uh, that collates the data coming in from around and has the communication that way. That's another way of doing it. Telstra uh, just recently, uh, last week, in fact, announced that they were switching their 
ground stations or 300 of them from using traditional satellites to LEO satellites. So what they're doing, uh, and this is a deal with OneWeb, mm-hmm. uh, is is converting those ground stations to work with the faster satellites. Yeah, well, Telstra and OneWeb are talking about a, a pretty incredible 25 gigabits of uh, bandwidth for their backhaul, and they're talking about that for their most remote customers, although I'm sure it'll be expanded to everybody soon. And in fact, I mean, this adds to the announcement that Telstra and Australia's other big telecommunications carrier, Optus, already announced with uh, Elon Musk Starlink last year. Yeah, well, they're, they're two different systems. This might be an oversimplification, but with um, Starlink, you've got a direct connection to the satellite and back. Mm. So it's just a, a bit like you and the satellite the satellite back to you whereas again uh both with um uh one web and their french uh partner and also with amazon they're looking at aggregating their uh their connectivity through a ground station so you may have several well a series of connections to that ground station from from different users and and that so um and that's got potential to be connected to like a wider network, area network. Mm-hmm. It, it just depends on how big it can be given that bandwidth because that bandwidth has to be shared. It's yeah. pretty impressive, but it will have to be shared. So there are two different models. Telstra has its finger in the pie of both. Yeah. So we already saw, I think it was AT Space, they were doing uh, trials last year where they were doing voice and video Uh, and data to unmodified Samsung, I think, Galaxy S22 smartphones from their, uh, you know, test satellites in space. I mean, different, again, to OneWeb, different to uh, Elon Musk Starlink. Uh, So when do you think consumers in Australia and globally will actually be able to make these calls and use data from regular new compatible smartphones, whether they're with Starlink, OneWeb, or anybody else? Well, MediaTek last year told me two to three years for video calls, Uh, obviously voice calls before that and texting even before that. That might be a little, uh, you know, might vary a little bit, but I think there'll be a fair demand for this. Um, It's it's a matter of a few things happening together. The the systems being rolled out in countries like Australia uh, and the phones vendors actually using those newer chips probably firstly in the higher end chips um but later in i I think it'll become ubiquitous that all phones will have that and and it'll be good for things like bushwalking safety if you're you know or in remote areas or bushwalking and you have an accident as long as your phone has power in it you ought to be able to not just do an sos which you can do on on right now iphones now but with you know very very limited range of things mm. that you can say about yeah. it, mm. to to much more expansive calling. So um, I, I would say you know two to three years would be right. Phone vendors are really looking for something new, and this mm. is really something new yeah. that they can talk about. Well, absolutely. And look, every phone vendor, every TV maker, every technology company always needs to give you a good reason to want to upgrade to the latest version, especially in a world where, you know, Google and Samsung are talking about seven years of updates for their latest devices. And of course, Apple has been giving devices for years. So you always always need a good reason to want to upgrade. We see the AI PCs and the AI uh, being injected into all the smartphone chips. So yes, they're always working on ways to get us to want to voluntarily part with our money and good on them for doing so because it's it's competitive. Now, is there anything else that we need to know about the coming satellite revolution and how AI, cybersecurity and more will be involved? Um, well, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, a lot of it is the software and uh, AI and, and cybersecurity is mostly about software mm. uh, because they will be targets, those satellites and, and their products. So presumably they, they have fantastic encryption. Um, AI can uh, these days is, is a good help with cybersecurity because with machine learning, you can see what the normal flow of data is like and you can see if there's someone trying to hack in. There, there can be a change in the actual flow of data within an organisation, as you'd expect, mm. the flow of data out. So um, there's that. There's But the other thing is for organisations, business and corporations, it means there's 
a whole new set of applications around edge computing, which is the name for uh, being able to do computing on the journey between point A and point B. Telstra, of course, that announced that a few years ago. They have edge computing. So because uh, some of their customers, they needed computing done uh, that wasn't being, uh, not, not in the cloud, but closer to them but without necessarily being on particular premises. So things like uh, stockbrokers, I'd imagine, could benefit from that where, you know, milliseconds or bits of a second might count and so on. So we're going to see the satellites themselves, uh, some of them capable of edge computing. Uh, I've, I've talked to the vendors and they say that the biggest obstacle to that or one of the biggest obstacles is the increase in power. Once you put processing on a little satellite the size of your refrigerator, mm. um, then you're using up much more power than just the power for moving it and operating it. So so companies have been working on that. And the company I work mentioned before, Allure, is, you know, that's what it's been doing. Um uh, so that that's one thing, and then the machine learning capability. And I, I mentioned the case of images, uh, being able to uh, uh, look at images on the satellite and decide whether they want to send them or not, or bunch them together and and do some trends around them. And the same for just basic data. You know, um, so companies can uh, streamline the the way their data is compiled. Uh, before it ever gets to them for wherever location that is. Of course, they won't need this for everything. I mean, we have fantastic fibre networks, which are much, much faster, again, on the ground mm. for normal business operation. But this will be when um, you've got, like, companies or corporations uh, dealing with remote sites. They might be mining companies or they might be uh, renewable energy uh uh, plants or, or whatever, and and there's data being collected at those or in the bush in Australia at farms or or, or horticultural sites, and that's where you want to be able to quickly move uh, data to the central offices in you know thousands of kilometres away, and then you've got end users as well, uh, the other use case in those areas, um, and, and uh, Things like you know sort of, uh, remote learning and, and that um, I, I've been interested for ages at the prospect of uh, remote surgery that's been talked about. I, I think you have to have incredibly good equipment for that, but those sort of things become uh, more viable the better the networks get. So for us, because we have so much remote territory, that's why I think looking at satellite technology is important, absolutely. even though it's not the only thing yeah. on discussion. Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the, the tyranny of distance has been with us for a long time in like telepresence and surgery and, uh, you know, the 5Gs and 6Gs. And I mean, all the other things that MWC I'll ask you about in a second. I mean, that tyranny of distance has never been uh, you know, smaller. And maybe by the time we have 7G or 8G, we can be teleporting ourselves across the the bandwidth to get to anywhere on the planet or in the solar system but that's a, well at least holographically hey yes we yeah, can start well, that's with right. that yeah that's exactly right exactly now um, no doubt mwc 2024 will have tons of 5g news and i'm really seeing all sorts of announcements about 6g being developed and it's going to be rolled out a couple of years before 2030 no doubt like 4g was a couple of years before 2020 and so the commercial availability is about half a decade away there's be plenty of new hardware and software and as we spoke about AI optimizations and capabilities. But are there any other hints of what's to come next week or are all the really big surprises still under wraps and under embargo for next Monday 26 to Thursday 29 of February when the actual conference is on? Well, a, a lot of the granular material, if you like, is under embargo. Um, there's uh, uh, quite an arsenal of phone vendors at, at uh, MWC. I don't. You you won't get Apple announcing anything. There, there's no. They don't go. Um, Samsung seem to be. They have their own events, of course. Uh, they seem to be concentrating more on their business users and also their networking capability. So that kind of hardware side of Samsung uh, 
I think you'll see probably a lot more about that. Uh, Huawei will be there. Uh, they won't, it seems, be promoting phones, but they'll be having their own, you know, quite a big mini conference within a conference with 22 sessions. So there's all of that. And then there's all this discussion around um, sustainability and um, and and also in, in the new age, uh, you know, sort of the, the profiles of business and, you know, communications environment. So it's a big conference and it depends on what interests you as to what you really home into. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I remember two or three years ago, Samsung was announcing that they were getting into the, the mobile tower and the networking equipment business, the same sort of business that Ericsson and uh, Nokia and Huawei have been in for many, many years. So, uh, yeah, all these big companies trying to own as much of the widget and control, you know, as much of the infrastructure as possible and sell their own technology. No surprises there. That's uh, the modern modern world. Now, Chris, you very generously agreed to join me sometime next week while you're on the show floor via a Zoom interview like this one, except you'll be there live and it will be fantastic to learn what you've discovered. But before we go, is there anything else that we need to know about MWC 2024, you know, your journey in getting there or any last sort of comments about uh, MWC that um, we should know before before you're on the ground? Um, well, I'd say that it really is a case of you know, whatever your interests are, there'll be something there to follow. Um, I haven't even, uh, for example, talked about manufacturing and robotics. Mm. And um, I just can't remember offhand the amount of money involved, but it's an eye-watering amount of billions of dollars out of <laughs> yeah. that technology by yeah. 2026. So there's another one. Um, uh, I, I, w- I would say to people, uh, keep your eyes peeled and you'll find um, something that interests you. If you're in the industry, for example, if you're in the tele- telecommunications industry, I can't see, I- I'd be wondering if, why you wouldn't have an interest in it because it's just so vital to see the movement in technology and we're seeing a lot of it in that at the moment. So we can find out more information about your article on the low earth orbiting satellites at uh, channelnews.com.au, right? That's right. That's uh, That's been published and uh, I'll be writing significantly more stuff once I'm at the conference itself. Yeah. And uh, so I look forward to talking with you. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, Chris, I really wish you the best of success in attending, reporting, uh, learning about, networking with and really, really enjoying MWC 2024, as I said at the top of the program. I do hope to be on the ground uh, with you as a fellow media member next year. So thank you so, so much for your time and have a lot of fun. All right. I look forward to that too. Thanks, Alex. All thank the you best. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.